Okay, it looks like we're live. Um, <laughs> as usual, we always have something happen when you join me on Facebook Live. Uh, we we had to switch uh, streaming apps to the um, one that's been giving me a problem in the past. So let's hope that um, I don't end up talking to myself again. <laughs> Uh, I'm Mitzi Soretto. Uh, welcome back. Uh, this is the second installment of uh, Facebook Live for uh, my new book release, The Best New True Crime Stories, Crimes of Passion, Obsession, and Revenge. And I'm joined today by Chris Edwards, who's coming to us live from Texas, USA. Hi, Chris. Hi, Mitzi. Thanks for having me. Hi, well, thanks for uh, sticking it out. We're back and forth emailing saying, I can't hear anything. <laughs> and then you had this thing covering half your face and you realized it was the piece of your desk. <laughs> yeah, the roll top desk, you know, part of it, little section of it almost down and, and uh, it just kind of um, was hanging out. You see, there's never a dull moment when you come on Facebook Live with Mitzi. <laughs> You know why? You know we don't do we don't do we don't do things halfway. We just like go all out there. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm so glad you I'm so glad you were able to come on. I see you've got some uh, famous posters back there. Oh, that again? <laughs> oh, well, that's the great uh, hillbilly Shakespeare Hank Williams back there. Oh, that's I thought that was Hank Williams. I'm not I'm not a, a, a country music uh, a, a really that up with it, but I thought even I knew who I was pretty sure, but I didn't want to make a mistake. <laughs> Great American composers, you know. Just, uh, it's definitely not Willie Nelson. We know that much. I've got posters <laughs> it's not a big spliff. Yeah, right, right. Well, I've got posters of him too, and other <laughs> paraphernalia around the house of Willie and all these guys. But, uh, but, but Hank is actually on my office wall, you know. And I've got like uh, he's like the one musician I think I've got. Well, actually, there's a poster from the show and. And uh, an old newspaper from the 20s uh, on this wall, but <laughs> see that. But Hank's the only uh, musician I've got up there. So. Yeah, he's definitely looking over your shoulder. <laughs> literally, <yeah. laughs> literally, literally, literally. Uh, well, um, you you wrote a, a very interesting story uh, for the book, and it um, it's called Bad Country People, which yeah. kind of is a good hint about what this is about. Um, uh, now, this is one of those unique stories where you're also in the story and, and no, right. you're not the criminal. You're not you're not caught, you're like in your jail cells, you know, you know streaming, streaming in with me here. Um, but tell us a bit. Of, tell us a bit about um, how your story, uh, how you're connected to your story and what how, how did you, you know, actually live in your story? Absolutely. Well, Mitzi, thanks so much for the kind words about the story and for, for getting it out to the public. Um the story, well, it is about a family of four, all of whom were tried and convicted of a double homicide that happened uh, here in the county I live in. Um, actually, the, the murders happened in front of a church located not even 20 miles from my home. Um, but anyway, the thing that connected me to the story is I knew all of the people who were involved uh, the perpetrators as well as the victims and having grown up with, with them, um, it was an extremely sad story to me, but also um, it was very unique in that, uh, I mean, how often do you find where an entire family is uh, our co-conspirators in something like this? And to me also being a big fan and being influenced by people like Flannery O'Connor and, and William Faulkner and all the great Southern Gothic writers, um, it, it really smacked of that kind of um, thing, you know, something that one of them might do. And that was kind of, you know, why I titled it Bad Country People. It was kind of a callback to one of Flannery O'Connor's great short stories, uh, Good Country People. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so, uh, Set the scene a little bit. I mean, uh, this is sort of a, a unique place. I mean, it's it's um, it, we're talking a really small, 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 small town here. <laughs> Absolutely, Mitzi. Well, the thing about Texas um, is, you know, you've got, you know, vast expanses of land between your, your major cities. I mean, there's a major world city, Houston, just not even 100 miles or so from me, but it, you wouldn't even know it from where I live. Uh, I mean, I, I live out in the woods and... Um, that's kind of the, uh, you know, the scene as it as it is around here in Tyler County. Um, we're a, a, a county. I mean, our, our major industry is, is logging, and uh, you know, we're we're about twenty, 
even 25,000. I would say about 23,000 people here in Tyler County. And, um, you know, one thing that kind of dovetails with this story and the reason why I'll get into here in a bit um, is that uh, tomorrow is the opening day of deer season. And uh, deer season is like another, I mean, it's right up there with Christianity right here in terms of, of uh, you know, number of adherents. I mean, man, if your house catches fire on the opening day of deer season out here, well, you better get a water hose or something because, you know, there's no one to help you. But, um, Poor deer. <laughs> right. So, yeah, um, uh, it's, it's a very rural environment and uh, a lot of uh, good, hardworking people uh, out here. And, um, yeah, so to say that this, uh, this crime uh, took the area of a good deal of its innocence, I think, would not be too much in the realm of hyperbole. Yeah, well, it's it's, it's very much um, in the in these types of community also. I mean, uh, people are, are primarily churchgoers, right? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, the uh, the murders happened in front of a church where uh, the family, the, the family of perpetrators, they were all uh, worshipers at this church. As a matter of fact, the daughter, uh, Kristen, uh, taught Sunday school. Uh, Kristen's mother uh, with a hand in the nursery there and, and the, the uh, father and the, the brother also attended the church as well. So, you know, everybody, you know, pretty much has a, a church home and, and uh you know, you, you see a lot of he is risen bumper stickers on the back of the backs of cars and things like that. So everybody's pretty much uh, you know, about faith and family values out here. They're the most for the most. part. Well, I suppose one could argue this family had their own set of family values. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If, if the name of your family is the Manson family or the uh, <laughs> yeah. Borgia family. <laughs> Yeah, this is true. It's it's all a matter of of, of context, you know. Exactly. Exactly. Um, now, um, you know, as far as um these people, the, the way they were, um, th there are some other circumstances that sort of warp them into this into this um be being bad country people, so to speak. Now, I mean, um, as 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 I know you, it, your story, it's really obvious that you have a great love for for this place uh warts and all and uh what are some of these warts that in a way you feel contributed to all of this happening well i'm glad you asked that nancy and that's a really good question um because you know as, as beautiful and as peaceful as this area is um there's a major drug problem and uh most of of the uh, the crime that's committed here in Tyler County and really here in the whole East Texas region goes back to one drug and that's methamphetamine. Um, it's, you know, you really, you can't live out here without, you know, knowing someone who has had firsthand knowledge or experience with that drug. It's, it's really sad. I mean, I go into the store all the time and I call them meth zombie. I see them walking around and scabs all over the face and just, you know, looking like the, the, the walking dead cast or extras from the walking dead. But methamphetamine uh, addiction definitely contributed to this crime. And um, the, uh, let me back up and kind of introduce the, uh, the perpetrators. The perpetrators who were all convicted of this crime were a family, uh, the Westfall family. Um, it was the mother and father, Letha and Paul, and then the children, Kristen and Cameron. Now, Kristen, the, the two victims in this case were a husband and wife named uh, Crystal Crystal Humphus Maddox and her husband, uh, Nathan Bradley Maddox. He was better known as Bradley to most people. Uh, and Kristen, or uh, Crystal, Crystal Maddox was actually, or, you know, she had just married uh, Nathan or Bradley. And uh, Bradley was the ex-husband of Kristen Westfall, and they had had a child together. And uh, Kristen, who had had major issues with methamphetamine uh, use and abuse in the past and uh, other types of addiction, um, it, it grew to the point of obsession where, you know, nobody else was going to get custody of her child. And, and she was able to get her family involved uh, in, in the crime. And her and her father were the ones who actually did the uh, uh, actually pulled the triggers on that day in January in front of the church. And um Prior to that, you know, it's let me let me backtrack because you asked me about my own involvement and kind of the way that I was involved in this story as, as a narrative voice. Um, 
and I, I set it up as such. It, it, it alternates between first and third person uh, POV. Um, it, it really it starts off with some of my remembrances of uh, Crystal, then Humphus um, as a child. Uh, I was I was in elementary school with her, and that's how it sets the scene. But uh, fast forward to uh, January the 18th, 2014, which is ground zero for this case in front of uh, Mount Carmel Baptist Church in Coleman Hill. Um, I had just recently, I was in the process of moving back here. I'd grown up here in Coleman Hill. And uh, this was around the time that I, I was, um, yeah, I was in the process of moving back when this happened. And, you know, I had really lost track of, you know, most of the people I had grown up with. I mean, that happens, you know, you move on, you travel, and, and a lot of people stay, you know, where they stay. And, and uh, but uh, Kristen, actually, I, I had kind of keep kept up a little bit with her because I had seen her name in the, the local paper and in the, in the police reports. And, and she had been arrested for uh, some counterfeiting uh, charges as well as uh, some possession of controlled substance, those kinds of things. And I had heard that, that she was in danger of losing custody of, of the daughter that, that she and uh, Bradley had, had 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 together. And um, and anyway, that that kind of plays. You can read more about it in the book for those of you who are, who are watching this. Um, but that's kind of a summary of a little bit of the family and uh, some of the drug issues that plagued the area. Um, and, and it definitely plagued into played into this. And also in the story, I get into. Um, a good friend of mine who's the DA here, Lucas Babin, uh, I interviewed him for this story. And he and I had kind of a similar trajectory in that uh, we both were better known for certain things outside of our day jobs. Uh, but he was much more successful with the things he did. I mean, he went and he was a model and an actor and all this kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, and he was in the entertainment industry working, you know, with some big names. And he had never heard of or seen anybody, you know, talk about or do methamphetamine until he came back here and to Tyler County and started working in law enforcement. And, you know, he's doing a really good job prosecuting in a lot of these cases and getting those dockets cleared. Of course, COVID kind of, kind of curtailed a lot of courtroom action last year, but he's, he's been back yeah. in action, doing pretty well, but you know, it, it just, he admitted to me that it just staggered him uh, when he started learning about methamphetamine abuse and addiction. And, and his take was, why would anybody want to do this? And it definitely, it's that one drug that, I mean, you look at what people put into it and it definitely does uh, have effects on a user's brain. And I think that's a, a large part of, of what happened here with uh, Kristen Westfall and, and his, uh, the obsession and, and just exacerbating uh, maybe thoughts that were already there, but taking them into the extreme zone. Yeah, well, also a, another good reason why her ex-husband and his uh, partner very much wanted to have custody of the child, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the talk was, is that, you know, Bradley or Nathan, I mean, he was, he was really getting his life together and, and he had, you know, he had known that life before when he was with Kristen and, uh, you know, he had, he had gotten clean and he was, uh, you know, back back to good and and uh you know, crystal was a was a great girl and uh they were they were really good from each other for each other from what i understand so yeah uh, yeah you you have in in this story too like you mentioned you went to uh high school with uh uh the protagonist or the, you know the the child's mother and uh that she was kind of a, a a real departure from the normal typical teenage girl in this town tell us a bit about that and and how because you you have some interesting descriptions of her in the parties and all of that oh, oh yeah well yeah Kristen, uh you know she kind of showed up i mean you know coleman Hill is one of those towns like i said you know most of us who, who went to high school together they graduated with me um we, we all knew one another, you know, pretty well through most of our lives. And then when, when somebody you know, transferred the rare times, when, when, when the rare occurrence, when a kid would transfer into our school, it was like, uh, it was like the outsiders are coming in, you know, but I mean, they, they all wound up eventually becoming, you know, acclimated, assimilated, whatever you want to call it. Um, but Kristen was, uh, stood out. I mean, she, uh, she came to our high school. She was a freshman had transferred from, uh, from the Houston area is where she had lived before. And, uh, you know, I think I was maybe a junior or so, and she would have, she would have been a freshman. So she was, you know, 14, 15, but, you know, we're all kind of out in the country and, you know, dressing our you know, Western shirts and Wranglers and boots, whatever, and t-shirts and 
she shows up, you know, she's 14 or 15 looking like a 20, 30 something year old stripper, you know, with the bad look and everything. And, and, uh, I mean, she stood out, you know, right away. And, um, but it was, you know, later, I think that the next year when she really started kind of trying to get people to, uh, to, to, uh, to like her and trying to buy her acceptance by through parties and things. And man, those, those were some wild times. <laughs> Yeah, you 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 touch on that in the book. And, uh, not sure when you're sober from all of that. <laughs> yeah, I think in, in the in the book there was there was one point where I made a mention of uh, you know, and, and it was my senior year of high school when she started throwing these parties, and some friends of mine and I we we would go out there you know pretty regularly, and I think I made the mention the last time that I had attended one before I had moved away or out of the area. Um, I didn't remember much about it, and there's probably an 80 proof reason for that. <laughs> well, you know, it, it almost sounds in a way, I mean, the whole situation is strange because you mentioned that when she was uh, in her teens and throwing these parties, she actually had like a separate house for yes. herself in, on the family property. Yes, she did. She had, a, they had, you know, two houses, and one of them, I guess, was before it was a guest house, but then Kristen had moved in there and kind of more or less had made it her, you know, party central. And, and uh, it was just, I mean, it was nothing to, you know, go out there on a Saturday night and there'd be 70 people crammed into that house. Yeah. And, and the uh, parents were sort of uh, in, they, they were cool with that, obviously. They were cool with it. And as a matter of fact, you know, at the time her father was incapacitated from a, a stroke or series of strokes or whatever. And I mean, he was uh he was dealing pills out of, out of his sick bed, you know, and here's some Percodan or, uh, you know, Vicodin or, or whatever, you know, so you mix painkillers and booze and high school kids. So, so the parents were kind of like, not exactly the best role models. <laughs> no, no, they, they weren't a uh, Jim and uh, Ward Cleaver for sure. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound like it. Um, so uh, you you mentioned about the obsession, uh, uh, the obsession factor, which is obviously an integral part of, of the whole theme of this of the book. But um, you said that they, they kind of weren't too happy about the fact that the child's father was uh, was doing OK for himself. He was finally, you know, making his way in life. And they right. didn't like that. They didn't like that one bit. And basically, uh, you know, it, it uh, again, like I said, um you know, where the, uh, the methamphetamine use and addiction kind of dovetails with this. When you have a drug problem that severe, of course, you know, there's going to be exacerbation of uh, you know, particular thoughts and obsessive thoughts and patterns. And, um, you know, Kristen's father, Paul, had, uh, was working at the time or doing uh, freelance work as, as a nuisance trapper where he would go and rid people's properties of raccoons and uh, skunks, whatever, possums, whatever kind of varmints were out there. And he was, uh, you know, when he was uh, well enough to hold a shotgun or rifle, I mean, he was, he was a really good shot. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, and I know this story got a lot of headlines, even uh, in the British press, because it's just the entire family was involved, which is a highly unusual thing, other than the Manson family, which, I mean, that's technically not a blood family. A cult. <laughs> yeah, a cult. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I can't think of anybody offhand, like any, a lot of cases that are the whole family is involved. No, I, I can't either. I mean, there's this is really unique. I think there was one, uh, actually, the uh, the mother of, of Crystal uh, Maddox, Crystal Humphus Maddox, had, had sent me an article about a family that uh, fairly recently that that killed someone where the whole there were it was like a family of three, though. I think this happened in Oklahoma, and I some time has passed. I, I have to dig the article up again, but it wasn't on the magnitude of, of this uh, crime, though. And, and this was and, and all all uh, this was actually four members of the family that technically were held to account, right? Absolutely. Every one of them was tried and convicted and uh, two of them received life sentences. Um, of course, Kristen Westfall herself received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. And the, the, the son, Cameron, he received a 10 year sentence. And I, I saw where he's up for uh, parole consideration. Um, and uh, 
uh, Crystal, the, the victim's mother, um, has posted a Facebook post encouraging people to, to send letters to, you know, against this decision. So uh, he was already denied one. The, 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 the youngest one. Yes, the, the youngest one. And the only reason why you know he got a shorter sentence, he got a ten year sentence, was because he actually cooperated and led the investigators to where the weapons were, were buried and everything. So, uh, yeah, yeah. What was he actually? But he didn't actually uh, pull the trigger. No, he had he had nothing to do with the actual. I mean, aside from helping, you know, hide the weapons, that kind of thing, he didn't pull the trigger or anything. And how old was he? At the time, well, he was seventeen at the time of the the murders, sixteen or seven. I believe seventeen. I believe. Yeah, that, that no doubt that contributes to his uh, his sentence being a little less uh, punitive. Right. But uh, still, still, I don't know. I, I one could argue, you know, if he was a member of the family, he's considered he's protecting them, right? Oh sure, absolutely. And and me personally, that's where I you know where I stand with it too. Pretty scary stuff. <laughs> so, so they're all still uh, they're all still alive, right? Because wasn't one of the the father was uh, uh, not in good health, right? Paul Westfall or Lloyd Paul Westfall. I mean, everybody knew him as Paul. Um, was always in very poor health. Um, you know, when I was when I knew him first, uh, he had, was bedridden. He had had a, several strokes or heart problems. Um, but at the time of the murders, I mean, he was up in ambulatory and uh, I guess had recovered. Uh, but when he was on trial, though, um, well, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. Before any of the family members were brought to trial, Paul Westfall was determined uh, incompetent to stand trial and, and taken and, and placed in a criminal uh, uh, hospital for the criminally insane, uh, Rusk uh, State Hospital, which is not far from from here. Um, and uh when he was finally deemed competent to stand trial, I mean, it was night and day because he was always a, a pretty large guy with a big beer gut and kind of paunchy and always just kind of lumbering. But, you know, he was rolled into the courtroom in a wheelchair and I'd die. If he weighed 150 pounds, I'd be surprised. But he was almost like the devil of the whole bunch of them, wasn't he? Absolutely. Oh yeah. And you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, we talk about drugs and everything being a big uh contributing factor to this as far as the mindset of what, you know, Kristen Westfall uh no doubt had in mind. But uh, you know, Paul Westfall was a very um, you know, conspiracy minded, I'm always talking about people, you know, out to, to get him and and you know, the the various factions that shape the world events, you know, this various uh Baroque conspiracies. I mean, it's nothing new. I mean, it's you see it every day on, on social media, but I mean, he just, I guess, was a little ahead of the game and <laughs> ahead of his time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, was that just his normal way of, or do you think that it was like maybe he was imbibing a little too many substances that kind of contributed to that? Well, as far as I, I know, I mean, you know, from what I saw of him, I mean, he was always going on about, you know, something or other. But I think that there there was definitely a little bit uh, over imbibing of, of various uh, painkillers and things that, that uh, he was might have been prescribed to, but might have enjoyed a little too much. So, yeah, that, that probably was a, a contributor to that. <laughs> Yeah. So it sounds like, it, you know, most of the family really were uh, imbibing substances that they probably could have done without. Oh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, you mentioned that that uh, uh, there was actually some uh, drugs and a weapon in the, in the bedside cabinet where the child slept, something like that. Right. Right. Yes. When uh, Well, this was actually before the, the family members were arrested. Um, an investigator uh, with the uh, county's VA office had come out there um, and had found a, a loaded weapon and a, a, a needle a syringe with some methamphetamine residue in it right by the, the bedside. Well, actually in Kristen's bedroom, but, but it was in the same bedroom that the child had slept. So, Yeah, it's a very good reason to want to get custody of that kid, obviously. <laughs> there were some other factors on the property that, that were, you know, there was, I mean, it was just un deemed unsanitary and unsafe for the child. Uh, but that was that was definitely a, a big red flag that this was nowhere that a child should be anywhere near. So. 
Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's pr pretty pretty awful. Um, so so actually, you actually um, also uh, have a journalism background and work as a journalist. So you covered some of this, right, when you were um, in your capacity. Well, I, I do. I mean, when I came back to to live here, I mean, I, I got a job uh, as a sports writer for the newspaper that I now edit, uh, the Tyler County Booster, which was you know covering blow by blow this case now. I didn't cover this when it, when it uh, took place or any of the aftermath for the newspaper then. I was just, um, I wasn't working for it at the time. Uh, this was a little later, or I was working for that newspaper a little later after that. Um, but in 2007, no, 2018, uh, our sister paper, uh, so the newspaper that I work for is under a publishing company, Polk County Publishing, that, that publishes five different newspapers and a couple of magazines. Um, they do the Polk County Enterprise, which is kind of the flagship paper and the paper of record of, of Livingston uh, in Polk, neighboring Polk County. They do a project every year uh, that focuses on regional history. And uh, in 2018, the person who was uh, putting that together at the time wanted to, to uh, focus on famous crimes in the area and asked me if I would do something on the, the West Falls and the, uh, well, the, the, the murders, the Maddox murders. Um, which I'm going to say from now on the, the Maddox murders instead of saying about the West Falls. And that's, that's a reason I'll get into in a little bit about uh, victims and, and recognizing victims, which I hope is something I did with this story. But anyway, back to back on topic. Um, I wrote a piece uh, that, that, that was an overview of the case um, for that particular project. And I was really pleased with the way it turned out. And originally, actually, that was called Bad Country People, but the editor uh, retitled it with an actual AP style, you know, headline and everything uh, that, that actually uh, distilled what had happened. But, you know, like I said, I was really pleased with the way it turned out. And then down the road, I just decided, you know, I was like, something needs to be done with this because I had a friend who was going to write a book on the case and then he decided to retire. And so that's where I decided to pitch it to you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and wrote a, you know, wrote a draft of it and, and was pleased with the way it turned out and sent it to you. So uh, here we are. Yeah, <laughs> I remember you kept, uh, you kept, you sent me this pitch and I really was impressed with the pitch and you, you, you were kind of missing the deadline. And I said, well, I'll give you, a, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for you before I close the door. Cause it's sometimes, you know, from a pitch, if it's really, really spot on, you know, <laughs> Apologies for that, Mitzi. That was actually the, the week that you mentioned. We had an ice storm here that took out everything. Yes. I was I convinced remember. I was going to have to fax it to you at some point, you know, um, if, if nothing else, you know, or, or smoke signals or something. That was but, that notorious yeah. ice storm, right, where your your Texas uh, utility yeah. company suddenly realized this is not a good idea to run our own utility company. Somebody made a lot of money from that. The question is who, but uh, that's a whole other you know, kettle of fish and soapbox and stand down, but it was, uh, it was <laughs> fun. I tell you that much. Uh, yeah. That was bad. Yeah, that was I'm bad. Yeah. For a bit. <laughs> well, it all worked out okay in the end since I got the story and it went in the book. So absolutely. Absolutely. And people seem to be digging the book down here too. So uh, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's got a following down here. Uh, you know, people are, are, are buying it and really enjoying, enjoying it and not just for, you know, my contribution either. Um, but yeah, that was, it's a great book. You got to get them to write raving and wonderful Amazon reviews. Oh, yeah. <laughs> get people Amazon. You know, haven't you noticed that the only people that seem to take time to write reviews are the haters, the people who have some chip on their shoulder and the people who love stuff just don't have time to write a review. That's a really good point. That is a really good point. And, you know, I see that now with a lot of, of new books and, and records and things. Uh, you know, it's only the the bad reviews, it seems. But like in the past, I remember I would make a game of, you know, looking up a really great book or what I thought was a really great book or a really influential record and just looking at the one star reviews. And it would always be the chip on the shoulder type uh People with nothing to say other than, you know, they might have hated the artist or the artist might have, you know, stole the guy's girlfriend or something. He was writing the <laughs> or, you know, something like that. It's, it's really sad. Uh, so you just to backtrack a bit, you mentioned about victims and, and you wanted to kind of give a little bit of um, time to discussing that whole element of the story. Definitely, Mitzi. Um, 
Well, you know, and this is not a common complaint to, to me. I mean, I think a lot of people who consume media will say the same thing. I mean, I work in media, but I'm going to say it anyway that, you know, I think that a lot of times that, you know, and a lot of it is to sell papers, but um, that we do have a lot of emphasis on the, the criminals themselves and not, you know, the victims. Um, and of course, you know, the who the who done it aspect and, and the mechanics of the crime, that has to be a part of it. But I really wanted to try to, to bring a lot more of the victim's story uh, or stories, since there were two victims in this case, uh, to the forefront and, and hopefully pay, you know, some homage to them while also, of course, having the, the nuts and bolts of the case uh, play out. Yeah, well, I think you do that. I mean, you, you've brought in a lot of uh, uh, information about the uh, the family that was affected, um, you know, the parents of the of the two victims. And uh, I think that's, you know, that's something I, I try to get everybody to do in the story, because I don't want to just sensationalize crimes or criminals. And, and sometimes that happens. And, you know, we don't want to make gods of criminals. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I tell you what, even sometimes it can be the opposite, where you have a victim who who is uh you know demonized. I mean, I know that in, in emails here recently we've I've you know mentioned the Black Dahlia, which is a case that I've invested a lot of time and money into researching. Um, you know, and of course that's unsolved. Uh, but at the time, you know, William Randolph Hearst, who owned most of the media or a significant chunk of the media in the country, was able to use the lurid nature of that and and really uh demonize the victim uh and you know these stories would pop up that she was a prostitute or that basically that she deserved what had happened to her um was was kind of the inference drawn from a lot of the coverage of, of the time so it's, it's just really it's it's sad yeah yeah well that still happens today <laughs> we haven't come too far unfortunately mm -hmm. but um uh we're going to segue now we've been just to the listeners, we've been talking uh, about Chris's story, Bad Country People, uh, which is in the best new true crime stories, crimes of passion, obsession, and revenge. Um, now, with reference to the gentleman who's looking over uh, Chris's shoulder, uh, Chris, you have an, another career. You're not just a writer and a journalist. Yeah, that's, that's right, Mitzi. Um, I'm a, I'm a singer-songwriter uh, doing the kind of, I guess, the Americana thing. Uh, and I've, I've been playing music for a really long time. Um, and, you know, after I moved back here to Tyler County, um, where the story is set, um, <laughs> again, um, I, I kind of, I mean, I was playing a little bit, but I'd kind of left it behind largely. Um, I had a, a family uh, uh, issue that I was was looking after, a family member and everything, and um, who, was, who was in ill health. And I, uh, I wasn't able to play out a lot or keep a band going at the time. But, you know, now I'm starting to get back into doing a little bit more. Actually, tomorrow night I'm playing. Uh, if any of you out there watching this happen to be in the greater Woodville, Texas area, I'm playing at the Magnolia Bar and Grill. It's actually uh, my sweet girlfriend is, is uh, throwing me a birthday party and I'm, I'm playing uh, later in the night. So uh, at the at the party. So, uh, so yeah, um, but I'm getting to do that a little bit more and I'm working on a recording project right now. And uh, it's it's always, you know, music has always been the one thing I've, I've gone back to um, kind of feeling the Jones lately to start writing songs again. So. Uh, so, yeah. And uh, the gentleman over my shoulder, uh, that's that's the great Hank Williams, a great Hank hillbilly Shakespeare, I call him. So. Uh, yeah. Oh, Mitzi, I think I lost you. Uh, I don't hear not hearing the sound. Can you hear me? Okay, how's that? You're back now. <laughs> you know what? You know what? This is why I didn't want to go back to this app. This is the third time it's muted me. And fortunately, I wasn't talking the other two times. So I have to keep checking this. Yikes. <laughs> this word, ah! Disaster scenario like with the other app. You know? uh, this is the real true crime. <laughs> So, so you 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 haven't been able to do a lot of gigs, obviously, with COVID. You've been kind of, you know, right? Yeah, last last year, you know, it was really rough on all of us uh, who play music. Um, and I mean, I had a lot of uh, work lined up. Uh, me and my duo partner Johnny Ray Hubbard, um, we had a ton of gigs booked uh, last uh, spring and into the summer, and and all of it canceled. And, you know, just uh, 
COVID really, it really screwed a lot of my friends over. Like because Texas is a big you know, live music is such a big part of the culture here. And I mean, every bar, restaurant, everywhere there's an opportunity to you know set somebody up to play. I mean, people will have live music. So yeah. 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 Well, did you want to um, do a little sample for our audience? Are, are you want to get your guitar? Um, I do. I've got a guitar. Um, there's there's a big echo off of the uh, from my microphone, so hopefully it doesn't really feedback or echo too bad. But um, it sounds good from here. Cool. Um, I'm gonna do something. Uh, like I was saying uh, earlier, you know, and we just celebrated uh, Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, um, and uh, the idea in mind about. Uh, victims of uh, getting some some recognition and, and celebrating those we've lost. I'm going to do this song. I wrote this probably about, well, uh, I guess it would have been written um, uh, 15 years ago in 2006 when my grandmother passed. I wrote this after she passed, and I never really did anything. I put it on the last record, I, I, the only record really that I've done, which came out uh, 10 years ago, so you know, it's time to do another one. <laughs> But I never really played this live um, until um, recently. My, my girlfriend's father passed. And, you know, when they were trying to, you know, get everything uh, in order for the memorial service, um, the music and everything, they had suggested um, this song uh, to, be, to be played. And so I played it. And this is just, I guess, for anybody who has, you know, experienced grief or, or you know, missing someone. This is called Flaxen Memories. Which actually, and I'll get into this later because I, I think you want to ask me about this later, um, if I remember correctly in the tenor of the email. But this is the, the title of this song is actually the title of one of the uh, short stories in a collection that I'm, I'm ready to release pretty soon. So uh, it goes like this. <laughs> I remember summer afternoons with you and back porch sheep and still. We'd sit around and laugh among ourselves. Light and breeze came to touch us every now and again. Now I'm left to hold the memories of the times we shared. It's flax and memories that just like gold Even if you wanted to, you couldn't let go Read some magazine and stay a while Back porch meetings will they bring a smile Watching the children and the cars pass by Day again, I hope we'll meet Someday in the sky, I know we'll meet And rustle up for us another One of those back porch seats It's flax and memories that just like gold Even if you wanted to, you couldn't let me go in Flax and memories that just like gold even if you wanted to, you couldn't let go. Let go. No matter how hard you try, you just couldn't let go. I remember summer afternoons with you and back porch sheep too. Back in the day when we didn't have a thing to do. Oh, that's great. Thank you, thank you. But yeah, um, you know, and that's not, you know what I like about it? It's not really like country music. <laughs> Well, it, you know, it's, I guess what I do, you know, when I first started playing, I mean, here in Texas, I mean, there's this big, Texas is home to all kinds of great music. I mean, a lot of the, the songwriters and artists that I really admire are, are all from Texas. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm big, you know, influenced by people like Towns Van Zant and Guy Clark, who to me, 
their lyrics transcend mere well, I'm, not, I'm going to say mere songwriting. I'm going to say they, they transcend the medium of songwriting to go into literature as to Hank Williams. Uh, but I mean, Texas has been home to everything from guys like that who are working in kind of a deeply poetic country folk vein to, uh, you know, you've got your Janis Joplin, your, you know, Karen, Clarence Gatemouth Brown and Rocky Erickson and, and the Butthole Surfers and the uh, Pantera and those kind of the Toadies, all those kinds of bands. So it's, it's a very eclectic um uh, gumbo to, to draw from musically and but you know when when i started playing music there was this big movement uh the texas country music m- music movement which was basically you know a, a way to flip the middle finger to nashville um <laughs> and it was all texas singer songwriters like pat green and, and cory morrow and all these guys uh you know singing a lot of songs about beer and floating the river and of course all those guys kind of developed you know you know, better songs later, but that was kind of the the gimmick for a lot of uh, acts in Texas. And that's kind of what I started, you know, when I started playing. And uh, I think that over time, I've just, you know, my thing is, I mean, I like all kinds of music and I I draw for influence from a lot of places, but I I really like um, a lot of slow country blues, a lot of stuff like Mississippi John Hurt and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Matt's Lips Come and, 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 um, you know, people like that. Skip James. Wasn't uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan from Texas? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he was Yeah, he's a Dallas Oak Cliff boy. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, yeah. uh, one of the places where I really kind of, you know, started, you know, really became a songwriter or wanted to become a songwriter was a, a bar in San Marcos called Chin Street Warehouse, which is kind of a, it's a holy shrine if you're a musician in Texas. Uh, the guy who used to own that place, he's passed, uh, passed away in the last few years, uh, Kent Finley was kind of a godfather and patron saint to a lot of musicians in Texas, a lot of great acts. Like, I mean, he nurtured George Strait's career, uh, Randy Rogers, Todd Snyder, people like that. Well, Stevie Ray Vaughan really got his start at Cheatham Street Warehouse. And, and uh, so it was really cool to get to play on the same, some of the same stages that Stevie Ray had played on. But he was just, uh, and I don't like a lot of electric movies, but I dig some Stevie Ray Vaughan there. <laughs> Um, if uh, someone wanted to uh, check your music out, well, where would they go? You you have a website or a page or what? I do. Um, it's uh, chrisedwardsmusic.com is the uh, name, is the URL for the uh, for my music site. And uh, I'll be updating it soon as soon as I get some new recordings uh, out and ready to, to get up and some new dates that are booked and everything. And there's also a Facebook page. It's, uh, it's just Chris Edwards Music. Um, and uh, the same thing with the writing. I've got a... a page for an author page on Facebook and I'm working on building a dot com for that. So uh so yeah, here's to here's to internet availability. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When it works, it works well. <laughs> oh um well is there anything you'd like to add as far as um any any new projects in the works other than the music stuff? You said you were maybe working on a collection of of material. I am. Um, I've actually got a collection. It's called. Uh, it's called. Nobody comes to visit anymore, and it's, it's a collection of fourteen uh, short stories. And it should be out in January. Um, it's. Uh, it ranges from kind of sweet to very very twisted, and and most of the stories are, are set in a, a fictionalized, highly kind of um, exacerbated version of East Texas. Although, you know the the. Names of the counties, towns are all fictionalized and everything. There's only there's one story actually that's set in Los Angeles during the riots of the post Rodney King verdict riots, and that's the only one that's not set in in this area. Um, but it, that was a lot of I enjoyed uh, putting that together. Um, I've got some other projects kind of on the burners. Uh, been working on a, a comic book project with a buddy of mine. Um, I love comics. I have for a long time been collecting comics and worked a little bit in them um but that that's one thing and i've also got a children's book that i've written uh that i just i don't have the illustrations to go with it yet but uh hopefully that'll that'll materialize at some point so and we're also still discussing a possible story for an upcoming book you'll have to get back to me on that absolutely and crossing fingers and knocking on wood and <laughs> <laughs> ah, <laughs> so, you're just the man for it <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you Oh, well, I'm so glad you were able to come on. Um, we've been we've been chatting with uh, Chris Edwards in Texas, uh, and he wrote Bad Country People, which appears in the best new true crime stories, crimes of passion, obsession, and revenge. 
So go out and buy it because there's another book coming out after the new year. So you need to keep up. This is book number four. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks for coming on and bearing with me with all these uh, usual <laughs> hijinks going on with these apps. <laughs> My pleasure, Mitzi. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. And good luck with the music. I hope the gigs, uh, it'll be safe to do more gigs. <laughs> me too. Me too. You know, and I, I've, I've been playing out. Well, I mean, I've, I've done a couple of things uh, the last few weekends. Um, uh, there's actually, I was playing at this, this folk festival that that's, takes place every year in Woodville. They didn't get to do it last year because of COVID, obviously. But I mean, the crowds were great. And it's just very encouraging to see that again. And well, of course, very encouraging to see the the decrease in the numbers and, and whatnot. So uh, good, good to see people out and willing to enjoy themselves again. So yeah. Yeah. Well, let's hope one day we'll, we'll be able to do that with the breathe freely again. <laughs> yes. And all Thanks so much. And from your mouth to God's ears. So, uh, from... <laughs> somebody's ear. Is anybody listening? I'm not sure. If I'm right. not <laughs> 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 Thanks again for coming on. Mitzi, my pleasure. My pleasure. Okay. Thank Bye.